Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Strategy Game Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Shippey, and I am so excited to have our guest today. Her name is Christy Vines. She is the founder of IDEOS Institute, and I cannot wait to share it with you. This is part of our Seen, Known, and Heard series. And if you all haven't tuned in prior to this episode, we are really sharing a, a series of expert leaders in this area to help us understand what it looks like to see, know, and hear each other, especially in today's environment. And Christy, you certainly have been a part of that journey. So can you tell us just a little bit about yourself, IDEOS, this brief history of, I, mean, I know we just talked about this offline, but, you know, kind of the condensed version of how you ended up here and then what IDEOS is. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Lauren. I cannot wait to unpack this whole space because it's just, it's, you know, it's what I get excited to, you know, every morning to get up and do. Um, so kind of the journey to IDEOS Institute really started and kind of found its formation when I was doing work in kind of the global conflict space, um, in particular around CVE, or for those that don't know what that is, countering violent extremism, um, and recognizing that outside of the big kind of multinational efforts and diplomatic efforts to come up with treaties and agreements that could you know allow for peace to continue or to sustain itself there was something happening beneath the surface that was much more about kind of the interpersonal aspects of kind of peacemaking and that it was when you know two leaders who often saw themselves as enemies all of a sudden discovered that there were some spaces or places of commonality that allowed them to just humanize one another, to see each other, a little bit of themselves in the other person. And that was kind of a big light bulb moment for me that if this is, if this can be effective at kind of the multinational um, arena, this absolutely can be effective in kind of the, the lesser, you know, impactful areas where, you know, we're not talking about the, you know, the annihilation of whole people groups, right. Um, or all out, you know, all out interstate, uh, or, you know, in national, you know, conflict across mm -hmm. borders, but more about what it means to show up as a leader, to show up as somebody who has influence and really, as you um, are working on really see here and know somebody else behind the superficial identities that we tend to respond, uh, respond to. I love that. That's so good. See a little bit of yourself uh, in others that really stood out to me because I think that you help people be able to do that. And that's that connection point where they can say, hey, maybe we're not so different. And I know we're going to get into that, but we've got some common ground here. And so I know that this is really, there are a lot of similarities between, you know, the, the writing that we're working on here and what you all do in terms of actually executing and showing people what this looks like to see here and know each other. So can you tell us a little bit about how IDEOS does that and what you all exist to do? Sure. So kind of at a high level, our mission ultimately is to seed empathy in the world. That's kind of the group, the really, you know, two second tagline, yeah. but the space that kind of undergirds that the foundation of the work that we're doing is in this burgeoning space called empathic intelligence. And so it's taking what often most people think about when they think of empathy and kind of adding very strategic layers of kind of neuroscience and physiology and psychology and really going deep, not in what most people think of as kind of what I would say is this warm blanket, kind of very emotional way of thinking about empathy, which actually impedes often our ability to empathize with people different from us but thinking about it as a very strategic way of engaging with people across any line of difference. So whether you're a corporate leader and your line of difference is generational yeah. or it's a cultural difference in terms of even how you see the work that you're doing all the way up to the kind of the big identity, you know, uh, the identity issues mm -hmm. uh, that we're also, you know, wrestling with around issues of race and gender and religion and then politics now. So yeah. Empathic intelligence really helps to unpack and kind of strip away the neural and physiological, largely unconscious responses that we have to people when we see them and what we would, you know, our brains process them as, which is enemy. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the work that we're doing. And we're doing that both from a research perspective and going, like, as I mentioned, really deep and building on the work of Dr. Rosalind Arnold, who 
is really kind of the, the big thinker and has written the tome on this, but for education and learning, and we're taking and adapting it to kind of society, culture, um, and conflict. So that's really the, the foundational work that we do. And then that expresses itself through things like documentaries and kind of showing what this looks like practically through our work through dialogue, which is how do you just kind of get started even having conversations around heart issues. Um, so there's lots of practical ways that we do this, but the real goal and kind of foundation of our work is this space called empathic intelligence. So empathic intelligence, if I understand this correctly, is essentially providing that framework for people to see, know, and hear each other? Would you say that's, that's okay? Yeah, that's exactly right. And okay. it's kind of the three areas of empathy kind of coming together. So it's the idea of kind of cognitive empathy. So it's how we think about somebody else. So it's how our brains are processing and wired to see other people. Okay. It's the relational piece, which is how, you know, how proximal are we to people and how do we do that work even in uncomfortable spaces where you have these differences? Mm -hmm. And then finally, what we call the sacrificial, sacrificial empathy. Most people would think of that as compassion, but okay. we take it a step further and believing that for societies to flourish, we all need to kind of show up with this idea of sacrificing on behalf of the least of these. And so it's kind of those three things coming together, which really form what we call empathic intelligence. That's incredible. Now you made a point that I thought was real interesting and uh, there's probably a an important nuance to clarify here that actually when we think of empathy we can think emotion or emotional response and you were saying that that can actually prevent us from being more empathetic or practicing this type of empathy why is that I'm so curious yeah really good question um and it's actually fascinating because we am actually emotionally we tend to empathize and easily empathize with people who are like us. Yes. But we're actually hardwired. It's that fight or flight kind of response that we have. Emotions will actually lead us to empathize less with people different from us. And the more different they are, our emotions actually kind of give, create this, we need safe space, right? We need to okay. be protective of ourselves. Yes. So emotions, if that is where you start, emotions actually prevent us from being empathic or, or empathizing with okay. those most unlike us. And so I always say that if you lead with emotions first, your emotions will lead you in the wrong direction when it comes to empathy. Yes. Interesting. That is so interesting. Okay. So where do you advise people start then if it's not with emotion? Because I think most of us just naturally think, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? If I can conjure up this empathy, this emotional feeling towards someone, then I can actually practice this, but that's not really the case. No. And I'll actually put a little bit of maybe a, a caveat in between, you know, what you just said and answering the question, because there are two big caveats I think are super important for people to understand. One is to understand what empathy or empathic intelligence actually is to define it correctly. Okay. So most people think about it as kind of walking a mile in somebody else's shoes or seeing through somebody else's lens. But we, we challenge that uh, definition because if your shoes or your feet haven't been formed the way somebody else's has, it will always be an imperfect fit. You'll never actually be able to understand what it is to walk in their shoes. And you're imagining it from your own perspective, from the, date, the, the limited data that you have yeah. about their lived experience, right? Wow. So you might have, you know, a 20% understanding of that. Well, that's insufficient to really walk in their shoes. And it gets really uncomfortable when your foot doesn't fit in their shoe. Absolutely. Uh, and, and that's true cognitively. It's a very uncomfortable place to sit. It is. And then the second um, layer is that empathy or empathic intelligence doesn't mean that you agree with someone or approve of somebody's decision-making, their behavior, all yes. of that. It's that you are seeking to understand, and I always say the number one important question that to ask to be more empathically intelligent is why. Hmm. And if you don't have the understanding or the lived experience of somebody different from you, you can't answer that question. And so to start, and the first place to start is to start, what we do is we call empathy mapping. So it's kind of taking the work that yeah. technology has perfected on um, the technology space over decades and saying, how do we apply this in a social construct? And so it's asking yourself first, you know, what are they seeing every day? What are they hearing every day? What are they experiencing? 
Yes. You know, what are they saying? What are they thinking? How are they feeling? And once you kind of unpack that, and that's kind of filtering through your mind before you make judgments about who they are, mm. you can actually better understand and answer the final question, which is what do they need? Mm. Because so often they're being driven by what they need, yes. but we don't ever think about how they got to this place. And so that cognitive piece really starts with an empathy map. And what's really fascinating is that the more you practice this, the better you get at it, where eventually it just becomes second nature to go through that process first before any judgments or bias kind of cloud the filter through which you're seeing someone. So that's really an important place to start. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is then how do you get that information? If you're so far removed from who they are in their own lived experience, and you can't effectively answer that question, then the second piece is that relational piece. And you can do that in several ways. Proximity is a huge one. So how are you proximal to those experiences and those individuals who you don't understand or you don't agree with or you find really problematic, right? And that can be your own family members. Yes. But the other piece, and it's really fascinating that the research shows that people who have been lifelong readers or consumers of stories are some of the most empathic people because they've been proximal to all of these different experiences outside of their own. And so they have actually expanded the lens through which they see kind of the world in front of them. And so rather than just having their own lived experience, if you've been a reader for your life, you might have thousands of proximal, like you've been proximal to thousands of characters and situations and lived experiences. So it doesn't always have to be interpersonal. You yeah. can, it can actually be a much more creative kind of intellectual experience. I love that because it, it becomes approachable. Like when you just said that, I, I had never really thought about that before, but you know, anybody can use their free like library app, right? To listen right. to stories. If you're not a reader, like to read a physical book, I'm a physical book reader, but that's not for everybody. You can listen to audiobook stories, you know, things in the, in the car when you're driving, like developing those foundational habits that will cultivate that empathic intelligence is, is I can imagine like a key part of practicing this. And I love when you said that, like the more you practice it, the more it just becomes a habit. I want to cultivate that habit because I can't think of a better habit or more important habit right now to cultivate, uh, especially in our environment. And it made me think of, um, are you familiar with clean talk? Like it's used in therapy a lot, like clean talk practice. So it reminds me of that where it's like the more that you do it, the more it becomes second nature. And I think oftentimes we forget that our brains have the ability to re we have the ability to rewire and repattern our brains to practice these things. So it's just, it's really encouraging to hear you talk about these things. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's And that's why we really talk about the difference between what is known as empathy and the work that we're doing in empathic intelligence, because it is, you can learn it. You can. Uh, and it is yeah. very strategic. Yeah. Um, and, and interestingly enough, some of the most empathic people have strategically wielded it for evil as much as they have for good. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's, it's an interesting dynamic once you start really kind of digging below the surface about the power Mm -hmm. of being an empathically intelligent person. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And I can imagine discernment, super important there to cultivate as you're learning, is it used for good or is it used for evil, right? Those are very important um, things to cultivate. Can you think of any examples? And I know in the documentary, and everyone should go watch that. And we're going to (laughs) link it in the show notes so that you can. I was a huge fan. It It was really neat because I hadn't seen anything quite like it in our environment. And it was like, I, I stumbled upon it. And Mm. that's how I first, I mean, that's why we're here. Um, and I was like, thank you. Someone is doing this. Like someone (laughs) is gathering people from all different perspectives and bringing them together and helping them figure out how to have conversations that they, they don't know how to have, that they're maybe too scared to have, right. Or, Maybe they have baggage or woundedness around trying to have these conversations and it not going well. So the documentary for sure is critical to watch, but can you think of any other examples of maybe recent projects or um, how you all have opened up some dialogue around the country 
or in a particular space so our listeners can get their hands around like, what does this look like? Sure. Um, actually, last year, we did two pilots, one in, uh, outside of Atlanta and one outside of Seattle, where we brought together kind of doing kind of the same vein as Dialogue Lab America, the documentary, we brought together in the community, very, you know, diverse, a very diverse kind of group of people who were wrestling with some pretty big issues. So outside of Atlanta, it was um, the issue of poverty and economic justice. And then in outside of Seattle, it was racial justice issues. And these were intentionally created to bring stakeholders together who are necessary to solve problems for communities who are the decision makers and policy makers for these communities who maybe don't see eye to eye with one another, who are divided along very political um, and socioeconomic lines. Yeah. And recognizing that for kind of our communities to flourish, for our nation to flourish, people need to feel like there's a safe place to go with these really hard issues of why we see, you know, moving forward differently. Yeah. And so we did that work with them over the course of several months and it was amazing the difference. Um, so again, going back to the work that you're doing, at, at the very least, the difference between when they entered into this project and when they emerged, the ability to see those who they would have considered their nemesis mm -hmm. as an ally, maybe not in total and maybe not on every part of the issue, but all of a sudden they could move forward together on some really common agreed upon actions that they could sustain. And this work, you know, we are not, you know, we are not the pioneers of this work. There has been an incredible amount of work being done in the space. A colleague of mine, um, Kristen Farrington, who's working in Washington, DC, has been doing dialogue work for decades. And she really inspired me with the work that she's been doing on kind of the gun violence, gun control debate issue where she just secretly brought together people on uh, who were very polarized and very personally impacted by this issue um, and who sustained that group all the way towards where they're working on, on gun legislation together. Wow. That's amazing. And so, you know, so this is such important work, but it's often being done behind the veil mm -hmm. so that people feel safe and protected. We don't publicize the names and often can't publicize even who, um, participates. Uh, but that that work is continuing. We've been just so encouraged by the even small results that we've been seeing in our work. That is amazing. And, and it's just common ground. So you're, you ha have helped people just come to a matter of common ground. And also, I would imagine, be okay, even if they disagree. I think that's a big thing in our, like an assumption. I think assumptions are dangerous. I'm sure you all talk about this to some degree, um, the power of making assumptions of others. And then, you know, yeah, I just wonder, is there anything in particular that you see as recurring blocks or something that's critical to point out that holds people back mm. uh, from getting to that place where they can work together or even talk together? Sure. And interestingly, it's hardwired in us. So it's not that they're like good people, bad people. It's literally each of us is hardwired in this fight or flight kind of mechanism that we have to enemize people. It's kind of, it's kind of uh, in the words yeah. of James Wilder, it's that kind of enemy mode that we go yeah. into. Yeah. And so the, the big question is how do we overcome that natural tendency to enemize people? Yes. And you see this in the in the in the documentary. Um, you know, we start with this like loosening up icebreaker of just like how many spaces of common ground can you find? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, what's even more important is that the story exchange piece that we start with and how powerful that is. Um, and so there's a takeaway that everybody can learn because so often we think, oh, I'm just going to tell somebody my story. Yeah. But when you tell somebody your story in a one directional way, each of us is filtering that story through a filter of all of the data we have accumulated about people like you, whoever you are, right? And so I'm actually not listening. My brain is needing to make patterns of your story. And those patterns are literally being filtered through what I what it is I already know. Wow. Largely, if you haven't been proximal to, to those individuals, 
it is a sum is a lot of assumptions, right? A lot of half truths, partial, you know, bits and, and bytes of data that your brain needs needs so that in moments of heightened, um, you know, where we're kind of being protective or very heightened situations, like we all find ourselves in now, yeah. your brain, your, your executive functioning actually shuts down so that you, your, so that fight or flight mechanism can go on auto autopilot. And so depending on the information that your brain has about people like them, you will, you you will unconsciously be responding that way. So what this, the story exchange does differently is that when we hear somebody's story in, and the job is to not just consume it, but to then retell it, especially in the first person, two things happen kind of in the neural wiring. One, our brains are no longer filtering it to make, to make those patterns where our brain no longer sees it. That's not the job for the brain in that moment. Our, the job is to really listen because we now have homework. We have to get that story right to tell other people. Yeah. So those filters largely go away and now we're deeply listening. Okay. And the second piece is when we retell that story, especially in the first person, your brain is absorbing information and it doesn't actually know really clearly that you're not talking about yourself. Wow. And so it's adding new data to your brain, not only so that you might see that other person differently, but the people who they represent, all of a sudden your brain now has new data. And so that sees that maybe as not a threat, maybe there's lots of commonality. Maybe now I understand the why behind who they are, right? And so it actually has huge impact in terms of just social change and how we see one another. Um, and so that's why the story exchange is so powerful because Otherwise, we are filtering everything, every new bit of information through those filters that we have amassed throughout our lifetime. That is so fascinating. So that now it makes sense, right? <laughs> when, you see, when you see the documentary, you will see that you set it up specifically so that they were taking in the other person's story and then they were retelling that person's story in the first person, which was incredible to see. So that makes sense. And it's so fascinating. Uh, Christy, can you, oh, go ahead. I was just going to give credit where credit is due. So that work actually has been perfected and practiced by an organization called narrative four. Okay. And they have actually applied that practice in places like Israel and Palestine in Northern Ireland, like on big global conflict. So this isn't just like, awesome. Hey, I want to know my classmate better. Although that's powerful. Okay. And we, and they do lots of work in classrooms. But this is actually being used at the geopolitical level wow. um, and very successfully. So I want to give them a shout out and credit because they really are the ones doing the hard work in this space. I'm glad you did. That's amazing. That's amazing to know. Can you share some key takeaways or just a few principles that our listeners can take away from this episode and start to practice right away? Obviously, there's a lot to learn and we're going to link to all of it you know, in the show notes so that they can get more involved um, if they want to do that, but just some key takeaways to help us all see, know, and hear each other better on the higher level. Absolutely. First, I'm going to give like a bit of homework. If there are people who you just are really struggling with, and this could be anywhere from a family member to an entire people group, mm -hmm. do an empathy map, literally yes. just start mapping, like asking those questions and writing down some answers, even if they are total assumptions. Yes. You know, what is the lived experience of the people that I most challenged to understand or engage with? That's first. And then the second one is super easy. If there is nothing else that people take away from this entire conversation, it is to bring the one word question that is the most powerful and yet least used probably in our entire vocabulary, which is why. Hmm. So every time you find yourself with that, like, Ooh, I don't feel good. Or that blood boiling or face getting red. Cause you're ready to go in and debate yes. somebody else's position before you do that, start asking, start using the question why to better understand what's behind the position they hold. And so we really teach that the two most powerful questions you can ever ask to become really, to become much more empathic in the way you live and engage with the world is what help me understand why you think the way you do and what is it that brings you to this position or this point or this belief, mm -hmm. um, super powerful. And it's so, um, 
it just decreases that tension almost immediately because now I really just want to understand your story. Yeah, absolutely. That is so, so good. Okay. I've got one more question for you. This is sure. not in the outline. This is a, <laughs> I just thought of it while we were talking. So I know you've done some work right uh, in the political space or in the, in the government space, but I think about this a lot because I think it's on everyone's radar as the, the highest point of conflict right now. Um, currently, I mean, we've got a lot around culture, but we look at even our government, our, our current leaders, from your perspective, what do you think they need in order to practice this empathic intelligence? Like from your perspective, what would you recommend? I think every, I think every incoming decision maker, leader, whether that's in government, corporate world, private sector, public sector, um, should have some training in empathy because it is such an important medium as a leader. Like if you are not an empathic leader, I would challenge you actually don't lead at all because yeah. everything then becomes really about leading from your own lens and perspective, which if anybody is really truthful is always going to be limited, restricted, and biased. Mm -hmm. We all, all are, we all have a bias lens. Yeah. The other thing is I often don't go to the highest levels of power, especially for our elected officials, because I truly believe our elected officials are a reflection of us. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to change government, then we have to change us because not only do we vote those individuals in, but they are reflective of their constituency. They are doing the, the job that they have been called to do, which is to lead from, from the, the, from as an elected official, from the you know perspective and desires of the people they serve. And sadly, they are serving a polarized public. Yeah. And so they look like the polarized public. And so I really believe that this is much more of a grassroots effort than a grass tops effort. Although I'm certainly happy to run any of our government through the dialogue lab. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> oh man, this was amazing. Christy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I cannot wait to share this with our listeners. Thank you for having me and great. Just sending you such good wishes on the book and the work that you're doing. Thank you.